Hello and welcome to another Thinking Particles video. This is a beginner's video, however, it will also offer some great insight for veterans. I'm your host Edwin Braun and I'll show you how to recreate the water fountain effect in a 100% procedural way with Thinking Particles. As was mentioned before, this is a tutorial from scratch and we will start from zero or nearly zero. So we have a very simple scene set up. We have this container, this large box here that would contain our fluid. And if we zoom a little bit more in, we have this weird animation going on. This box uh, following this path, this elliptical path. And we'll get into it why we have chosen this path and this box and what we are going to do with it. Our target is we want to recreate these little fountains and we want to turn the fountains on and off. So that's how we will achieve this effect. And once more, this is from scratch, so nothing is prepared. It's not an explainer video where we have a setup and I'll explain how the nodes and everything is connected and why we connected the nodes. We will start really from scratch. And that means the first thing we are going to do is create a particle system. So we create our thinking particles helper and it doesn't matter where we place it. We can place it anywhere in the scene that will create our thinking particles system. I'll bring up the user interface by just clicking the properties button. And this will bring up our thinking particles user interface. So we are going to do some basic setups we would usually have all the time. So the first thing is we create a particle group. So I'm for sure want to have a particle group where I put my fluid in. So I'll just name that fluid. That's my fluid particle group. And I would need a particle group called emitters. That will hold my emitter particles where I emit the stream of uh, water or the fountains. Then if we have our two particle groups, we are going to the dynamic sets and within the dynamic sets, we will control our flow or our simulation. So the first thing is I know we would need probably three dynamic sets. The first one I name create. That's our dynamic set that will create the stuff. Then uh, we have another dynamic set that we will call, call gravity. And we'll have a dynamic set that we just call simulation. So we should be able to get away with all these dynamic sets. And while I think about it, let me make one more dynamic set and this one we call on off because we want to turn the fountains on and off in a procedural way. So that's about it. I think we have everything prepared. And now let's start with our create dynamic set. I'll select that, move that a little bit uh, bigger, and then we'll start adding our create dynamic set. The first thing we need to create is our emitters where we emit our fluid. For that, I'll, uh, I will now not use keyboard shortcuts. So I will use our menu so that you can see which operators I use. As mentioned before, this is a beginner's tutorial. So we go step by step and see how we can set up the effect. So the first thing we want to do is add an operator that generates something or creates something. And I'm going to choose a particle draw operator. So the particle draw will allow me to draw particles in the viewport. And then we can see that we are able to draw particles. So we can choose where we want to draw the particles. I want to draw them in the emitters because I'm going to draw the emitters where we emit our water fountains. And then when I go and look, we have no other way except the time span. We need to make sure that our fountains don't die. So we have to have a, a really long lifetime. So 
that's about it. We can't control anything else, but uh, probably I would need to control something else like uh, size, rotation, orientation, and all these kind of things. But for now, we should be fine with the particle draw and we can start creating particles. So I'll just click the draw particle button. Let me just move that out of the way for now. And we are going to zoom in here and I'll draw a particle right here, another particle right here, a particle right here, and a particle right here. So now when I start the simulation, we will have our particles just sitting here where we drew the particles. So now we have four fountain emitters. These are the four fountain emitters. And when I play the animation, we can see our box is touching them in all dimensions. So when we look on the side, we see it encloses the particles. So with this idea, I want when the box encloses the particle or other way around, when the particles inside this box, I want to do something. So I somehow can detect the particles inside this box and then do something. So we need that for later. So that's our setup. Um, because I already mentioned that we want to control something with our uh, box, I probably want to control our emitters. As I mentioned, we want to turn them on and off to do uh, water simulation or fountain simulation presentation or controlled by sound and music or whatever. So we are going to add a data channel and I'm pretty sure we want to control the speed somehow. So I'll create a data channel that's just called speed for the emitters. I'll add this data channel. So now every particle I create, every emitter of of water fountain is attached with a speed value. So when we create these particles, we have a channel, an extra channel in there that allows us to uh, have a speed value. What we want to do is grab a standard operator particle data. The particle data will allow us to access all the data we have. And if I select my emitters, I'll have a speed the channel, the data channel we just created for the emitter particles. Now I will be able to have, let me just go into helper, helpers and uh, let me just get a float helper where we assign a value of zero. So right now we can be sure we create the emitters and their initial value for the speed will be zero. So the Fountains will be off when we start with our animation. So that's the first thing we want to do. Now we have achieved the following thing. We create our emitters, our fountain emitters. From these positions, we want to have our water flowing. And then we make sure that the uh, speed data channel is initialized with a value of zero. The next thing we want to do is create an actual flow of fluid. And for that, I'll grab the emitters and access the emitters we have created up here. So the order is very important in thinking particles, the order of operators. So we'll start uh, at the top and then go down. So the first thing is we create the particles and then we'll access all the particles in the emitter group and we are going to use another generator for our fluid. So we go to generate particles and we are using the flow emitter. And for the flow emitter, I'm going to uh, give the flow emitter the positions. So the flow emitter needs a particle input. So for every position of a particle, it will emit new particles, our flow of particles. Then we are going to use 
another float operator. And I'm lazy right now. So I'm just going and grab this float node, hold the shift key and drag it down. So I want to control two values. We want to control the amount of particles we emit and the speed we emit. So I'll drag and drop, uh, shift drag another float there. So now we can access our speed value and we'll use the speed value. So it'll become clear in a second. I'll, I'll tell more why I did it this way. So the next thing or the next value we want to control in here is our actual speed. So that's the emission speed or the power we shoot the particles out of our emitters. And we want to control the rate of our particles as well. How many or how much water pressure we want to create, how many particles we want to create. So we control the rate, all based on the speed. And here we already see something is not right. We How, how can we control two different things with um, one value. And the great thing is each of the float allows me to have a multiplier and I can adjust a multiplier. So for the speed, we go here in world units. I'll just go to 4,000. And these values are just testing out uh, and, and uh, getting the values right. But for now, to make the tutorial not too long, I'm just uh, typing in the values I found that uh, are most pleasing for for the effect. So the next one is 50,000. And that's it. That's our rate. So now I can control with one value two things because I'm using this as a multiplier. So that means when I have one, I get my maximum values here. So if the speed is one, we get 4,000 of speed and 50,000 of a rate value. So let me just collapse that. I'll do that with a double click on the title and it collapses to only the connected values. So now we have the following. We control all the uh, particles here so we have the float value, the speed and the rate. Let me just make sure that our flow emitter is creating all the particles in our fluid group. So now all the particles land in the fluid group. And we need to make sure, just a, a, a important tip, it's very easy to create uh, infinite loops or crazy setups that will kill the system. If we were to create these new particles, our fluid particles in the emitter group, that means we create more and more emitters and more and emitters and more emitters. So we have a death loop here and we don't want that. So it's always a good idea to double check what you're doing and which is connected to what. Then the next thing is we want the rate per area. So that's what we set here. And our size factor, I want to go to a value of two. Our speed is controlled with the float value. So we don't need to set anything here. And everything else, also the rates per second is set with our input here, the rate. And all the rest we just keep as is. So we don't need to adjust anything here. So that's about it. So if we were to play back the simulation right now, we should already see something. Let me just move that out of the way for now. And let's have a look on the left side, from the left side. I'll go back and forth to reset the simulation and we can see nothing is happening. So we need to make sure we did not forget any connections. And I know that we did choose emitters. We created the emitters and we're accessing the emitters and we're using the fluid float values. Ah, oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> now I ran into the issue. Um, 
we initialize with a value of zero. So we get our value from here and zero multiplied with any value is always zero. So for now, how about I'll use a one. Here we go. Let's try that again. I'll probably keep that in the video so that you can see. Um, you can easily make some stupid mistakes. Everyone does them. So, and now we can see our fountain is shooting up high, high in the sky. So here we have our water fountains. From each position, we shoot up the particles. So the only thing that's missing is uh, some kind of gravity. And that would be our next step. So I'll keep it for now at one, but we want to start with a zero emission because our box should turn them on and off. But for now, we keep it at one. So let's go to the next dynamic set. Let's add a force. So we're going here into the force and I'm just using the built-in thinking particles force, very simple to control. And I want to apply the force to my fluid particles and only to the fluid particles. I don't want the emitters to have gravity or they would just float away and we have water spraying all around. So we don't want that. Only our particles should get the uh, gravity, the fluid particles. And for the value, we are going to use real world values. So we go to 9,810 millimeters. We are now in millimeters. So that's why we have these high values here. 9,810 millimeters is our force negative. So it will push back, push down our fluid. Let's see if this is the case. And let me just reset our animation here and see if that works. So right now we can see particles go up, gravity brings them back down. Because we don't have any further simulation, everything is mathematical correct. So it goes up and is pushed on the same path down. There's no interaction. We have no simulation going on, no fluid simulation, nothing. So for now, I would like to continue without the simulation part and just concentrate on the on and off. So for the on and off, I would like to make sure. So as I said, we are skipping simulation for now. We just want to control the on and off. Let me just go back and initialize with zero. Keep in mind, that means we have no flow, no fluid at the be in the beginning. And our box, our animated box here, let me just go back and forth. Now, no fluid is emitted. And our box, let me just uh, activate the viewport up here. And we can see the box is moving. So whenever the box is, or the particles inside the box, we want to turn it on. So how can we do that? How would we do that? The first thing is we need to grab our emitters. So we want to measure our emitters. We need the position from the emitters. And then I want a condition. And the condition is if the particle is inside the box. So that's our in-mesh condition. And the in-mesh condition needs a node. So I'm going and create a helper and I'll just use a helper node in the standard. And the helper node has a pick node option and I'll pick, some, pick my box too. So now I'll connect the node with the node, double click again the title, double click, and we'll get it collapsed to that. The next thing is we need, so now we have our box that's moving around. However, we need a position to measure it against. So. We are grabbing the particle output because I'm lazy. I'm just using the particle output. We could use just a specific output like position and feed in the position. 
because I'm lazy and want to have a clear wire interface, I'm just feeding in the particles and thinking particles automatically grabs what it needs from the particle emitter stream or connection. So that's our information we need here for our in-mesh test. The next thing is, so when the particle, our emitter particle here is inside of our box, we get a one as output or true as output. So the next thing I want to do is add a special node and the node is called egg timer. So you'll find it under helpers time. And the egg timer is really, it works like an egg timer. So you give it a uh, flag, turn it on and it runs for the set time. So I'll just say, okay, you start the egg timer when the box or the particle is inside the box. I'll start the egg timer. And the next thing I want to make sure, I'll just double click here again. This needs to be per particle. So each of the emitters has its own individual timer. So I feed in the particle interface. Now the egg timer is treated per emitter particle. So now when the timer is running, I want to do something. As long as the timer is running for this amount of time, let me just put that to 15 frames. As long as it's running, I want to do something or set something. So again, I'm going into my operators. I'll just grab my particle data. I'll make sure we choose our emitters so we get our data channel for our particles. And I'll connect the particle. And as long as we have our egg timer running, we want to make sure that our particle data is set. So, the next thing I want to ensure is, so now we have this setup. So our particle is inside the box that is animated. When the particle is inside the box, we activate the egg timer. The egg timer runs for 15 frames. So that's half a second. So the timer runs for 15 frames. And as long as the timer is running, we do something with the particle data. And what do we want to do with the particle data? We want to set the speed or turn it on or off. And for that, I'm going to use another helper. And the helper is we are looking for is a value to value. So I'll go into the standard helpers and I'll use a value to value. And I'll connect the value to value with our speed. The great thing about the value to value is we can control the output. So we feed in any value and we can say, no, I want it different. I want it a different output for different inputs. And what we are going to do is we're using the time relative. So the time relative output of the egg timer, and you can read that up in the user manual of Thinking Particles, the time output of the egg timer, the time relative means it starts with zero and counts up to one. So one means we have reached the time. So 15 frames in this case, or whatever I put here, when we reach that, it's one. So we're connecting that to our input. So what that means is when this reaches one, we have reached our 15 frames and we set the uh, speed. We just go if we between zero and one, we output zero and one. So now I might want to have a different curve, for example. That's why I um, prepared for or use the value to value. So I'll just go here and we make a curve and we have a very fast, steep curve to go to our one. And that means right now our 
value, the speed will be kind of inverse because what we want to have is when we reach that, we want to turn it off. So after 15 frames, we want our fountain to turn off. And when it starts, we want to turn it on. So right now, something is missing here. It's the other way around. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get another helper. And in that case, we need a math helper. So don't worry. It's not complicated. Math is, is our fun and we all love math. And in that case, the only thing we want to do is we feed in our time relative. Uh, the only thing we want to do is we want to inverse our values here. So everything that goes here is just the other way around. And now we get the proper output. So if we didn't do any mistake in our wiring or setup, we should have the following now. Whenever the particle is inside the mesh, we activate the egg timer. The egg timer runs for 15 frames and for 15 frames, it will turn on our particles or speed. It will set the speed to one. And as I mentioned up here, with the emitters here, we set or multiply the value of speed. So we have, when the value is one, we get 4,000 and 50,000 as a rate. When the value is zero, we get zero, nothing happens. And we initiate, initialize right now, the value with zero from the beginning when we draw the imagers. So we have everything set up right now. So if all is fine, we should see our particles now activate. So let's start and we can see something is happening here. So let me just show you in the perspective view. And wherever the box is, it emits particles. So we now achieved our fountain behavior. So now we can control from the outside in a procedural way with the box just animating back and forth in and out whatever we want to do we can turn on and off our water fountains we could have done several other ways we could use texture maps for example and trigger it with a texture map or trigger it with a spotlight or whatever we want but right now we are using this approach which is pretty simple and easy to follow so the only thing left now is we want to have a real simulation of water. So let me just get started with our fluid simulation. The first thing you want to create with our simulation is a flow. And the very first thing is we create a flow group. The next thing we are creating is our boundary because we don't want the water to disappear into uh, oblivion. We want to have it contained in our box. And the next thing we want to do is we want to go and have our flow solver. So for the flow solver, I'll give it some subsamples because we have uh, real powers and real time simulations a lot of forces, so I make sure I have two subsamples here. And then I'll also think we might be generous and spend some subframe sampling for the physics as well. Well, not that many, two should be should be enough. We, we can see if our physics are working. But now we, we are, have a generous amount of simulation uh, sampling in there. So we've created all these uh, settings and now we have to choose which solver we want to use. I'll use this flow solver. We can have multiple flows, multiple simulations in one scene setup. This is why I choose which solver I want to use with this group. Then I want to, or I need to specify, these are my fluid particles. And I'll, just for the sake of this tutorial, I'll use this solver. 
Well, there's no reason behind it, but I just use that one. And then we can go and set up our fluid solver. But before we do that, let me just set up our boundary. And for boundary, I'll just add our container. This is our container. I'll make sure it's not pushed away by water collisions or anything. And then we have our boundary set up. Most important, we need our flow solver. And just to remind you, because that just happened, because I, I know how Thinking Particles works, the order is very important. The flow solver or any solver in the simulation should always be last in the hierarchy. If we move the flow boundary after the solver, we would have no collisions at all. And I'll, I'll show you in a second. So keep in mind, the order is important when you set up a fluid simulation. So if you are following with this tutorial and you recreate it, make sure the order is as I showed it. So now I think we have everything there. Let me just go back here and we can just try out our fluid simulation. And even with the uh, default settings, we get already the simulation we are after. So now we have our water fountains, even with the default settings. But however, we can just fine tune a little bit more our uh, solver settings. So to just get a little bit of a better behavior for our phone. And again, this is just um, trial and error. Find your settings you like that uh, gives you the most pleasing result for our fluid, for your fluid simulations. And I want to have it more splashy. So I'll reduce the pressure here. And I want to also, I think I'll introduce some spacing, forced spacing, and that's about it. I think we can just reduce this a little bit because we have the pressure compressed very high and also maybe a little bit of friction. So usually you should have friction or it would be like on ice and bouncing forever. So I, I just give it a little bit of friction and keep in mind, we have flow solver steps and um, thinking particles, sub subframe sampling. So friction is added per subframe. So we can get away with very low values. And I think that's it. We don't need to adjust anything else here. As I mentioned, this is now a matter of taste, how you want to uh, create your fluid simulation. So now we have this beautiful water fountains shooting up into the air. So that's how you can create fully procedural water fountains activated with this little box in this case. As I mentioned, we have many other procedural ways and options to create these water fountains or these kind of effects. And now we can also play around with our activation because it's fully procedural. We can tell the system how long we want to keep it on and off. So let me just reduce it to five. So very short time. Then we will have these little shooting fountains that turn on, shoot out the water and splash down. Or just keep it on for a second. And now each fountain is 30 frames, is on for a second. And we have this nice falling down effect, this little mushroom water effect we have here. So a lot of options, a lot of things we can do here. And that's the end of the beginner's tutorial for creating fully procedural water fountains. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Um, excuse me some uh, stumbling and all this. This was uh, recorded in real time on the same machine doing the recording, the audio recording and the simulation on the same machine at the same time. 
Thank you again for watching this video. I hope to see you again and check out our other tutorial videos as well. Thank you so much.